Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I think I'm finishing up in the little book of James today. Really had a great time in James. Uh, I want to give you the two key things in James. James tells us twice how to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, and he's sure letting the people that are walking in the flesh have it. He really is. And that for that, that's good, because any of us, uh, without even realizing it, we're not walking in the spirit of who we really are. And so he continually goes over that point. But I like the two key verses that lift us up and tell us the how-to of not walking in the flesh. Number one, I brought this up last time, is practicing the presence of God in every situation. Practicing the presence of God. Now, what do I mean practice? Well, in any situation, it, it always looks downward, it always looks negative, and it is negative. It can be very negative. But practicing the presence, James says, means to him, count it all joy when I go through these things. Wow. Now, Paul says in the book of Hebrews that the sacrifice of praise is well-pleasing unto God. Psalm says you enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. So you enter into the presence of God simply by praise, by thanking him, by seeing that somehow in this negative is a greater positive. And I, and I said this to a friend of mine just recently, and I love this. I wrote this on a, pa a paper. I'm going to put it up on my refrigerator. Maybe you might want to do the same thing. It says behind every negative is a God positive hidden within. But of course you have to go treasure hunting to try to find it because you just simply practice the presence of God and praise Him in the midst of it and you watch the Holy Spirit will bring you, I mean, He will usher you right into such glory you'll forget how negative things really are. And that, that is the truth. That's walking in the Spirit. The second key is looking into the mirror. He says that in chapter 2. Of James. No, it's in chapter 1, sorry. Verse 25, he said, They that look into the perfect law of liberation and remain therein will be successful in everything they do. Okay, well then, what does that mean? The perfect law of liberation is, uh, per it, perfect is complete. Law is principle. The perfect principle of liberation really is the person of Christ. So it really is the complete person, the completed, because Christ has done the complete work at Calvary, finished work, the finished work of Christ at Calvary, he completed it, and he is the person of total liberation. So you look into that mirror, you look into Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and you praise him in the midst of whatever you're going through, and God will, you've just humbled yourself before God, and he will lift you up. Now we're in chapter 5. James goes on and he continues to lament about the, uh, these Jewish Christians that have, they've received Christ, but they're sure living as if they're not, they haven't received Christ. And of course, that's what Paul calls carnal Christians. And carnal Christians, you know, are just thinking about themselves. They're self-minded. They might be sin-minded a little bit, but basically, they, usually the mind, the mind goes like this, oh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll have a little bit of Jesus, I'll have a little bit of religion, I'll have a little bit of the Bible, and I'll pray, pray occasionally, and I'll go to church sometimes, but basically, I want my way most of the time, and God, you know, God doesn't expect me to be perfect anyway. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of the mentality, and so therefore, you just live your own life, your, your own soul life, and you're not living in the life of Christ that's available to every born-again Christian. So he goes on and he's, he's, he's letting these people have it. Verse 2 of chapter 5 says, you, Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. He's pretty tough on them. Your gold and silver is cankered and, your, and the rust of them shall be witnessed against you and you shall eat 
your flesh as it were fire. Wow, wow, that, that, that's pretty daunting. I mean, I can't even imagine what that means. You have heaped treasure together for, your, for the last days. In other words, what's going to be the reward of this? What is going to be the reward of this living? We, I mean, we're headed towards the time when Jesus Christ is coming. He's going to come with rewards, you know, to them that, I mean, it's either going to be wood, stubble, and hay. You live like this, and it will be wood, stubble, and hay. But you simply trust the Lord Jesus. Don't look at and measure yourself against other people like, oh, I haven't done enough works. I haven't done enough. Don't do that. Know that being is the point. And you practicing the presence is the point. You do that, you'll be well pleasing unto God. He'll say, "Faithful, you are a faithful servant to me," and 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 you'll be through. You'll have the joy of the Lord. You see, so it's not really hard. It's not. There's not a bunch of rules. There's not a nut, bunch of how tos. How to be a better person. How to get greater crowns and none of those things. You just walk right in the spirit and. You won't be able to miss it. And you'll, you, he will crown you. He will crown you with the crown of life, James says. And so now he's back again talking to the ones that are not talk, walking in the Spirit. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. In other words, you're needy all the time, never enough. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. So he is, he's coming against them pretty hard. You have condemned and killed the just and you... And doth not resist you. And so, so this finally he's getting to something positive. So let's go there in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren. He is talking to Christians. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. That's a word for us today. We know the world situation, and it's not getting any better, and it's moving towards the time when Jesus will appear and on the Mount of Olives, and they'll, it will split. Wow. And the... And, and the Jews will see, and they will see the one they pierced, and they will cry, and, be, and many will be born again. My goodness, what a day. What a day we're going towards. Behold, the husband waits for the precious fruit of the earth. In other words, be patient. Just wait on what God's going to do through you. Don't rush out to do anything. Do nothing until you can't not do it. I had a, my old missionary friend told me that one of the best uh, uh, advices he could have ever given me. Do nothing. People just rush out to be doers of good. Don't do anything until you can't not do it. And then it's the Holy Spirit doing it through you. And, and, and he says, and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. In other words, he's talking about in a, when, you're, uh, uh, when you've planted a garden, you have to wait for, for it to yield its fruit. So it doesn't come right away. It t comes in time. So we're in time now, and our patience really is the patience of the Lord. That's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. You start praising Him, and you start practicing His presence, and it will automatically cause you to be patient. I can remember saying, Lord, I don't care how long it takes. You take all the time in the world to accomplish what you need to accomplish in my husband, in my children, in my situation, and in my life. You take all the time in the world because you're doing a great work. I couldn't say that if I had to have it right now, like most people have to have microwave living. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Wow. Let me read to you what Peter says. But the Lord of all grace called us unto eternal glory. This is chapter 5 of Peter. It says, by Jesus Christ, this is verse 10. After you have suffered a while, he will make you perfect or complete, established, strengthening you, settled you. You see, the Lord, the Lord will settle you, establish you, strengthen you. You start practicing the presence of God, and you start seeing that every negative has a, a God positive behind it. And but you. You wait for that God positive, and you can trust that it will be there. So you praise him for it before you even see it. That's faith. That's real faith. That's faith in, in God, in his faithfulness, not my faithfulness. It's never my faithfulness. It's his faithfulness I'm depending on, and he's always been faithful, and he always will, and he cannot lie. 
So whatever he tells us, he cannot lie. So he promised us uh, peace, he cannot lie. He promised us that we would experience his life in us, he cannot lie. He promised us a new identity, he cannot lie. He promised us a new life, and it's the light, the eternal life of, the, of Christ within us, he cannot lie. It's yours. You just have to practice the presence, say, okay, I'm going to take it by faith. I already have it against how I feel or think. Okay, let me continue on in James. It says, Grumble not one against the other, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Wow, that sounds like he's expecting Jesus to come back any time. Well, um, I think it's expedient to think that he will, is coming back any time. A lot of people say, well, I've been hearing that for centuries and centuries that he's coming. And he hadn't been here yet, so let's eat, drink, and be merry and have a good time because he's not really coming. No, in every generation, we should be expecting the Lord. So I think it's wonderful because it, it keeps us knowing that, boy, we better be seeing and praising him for his presence in whatever's happening to us. And then we're going to be like the virgins that have the oil that is lit instead of the poor virgins that he, he didn't even, their, their light was not lit and he didn't take them. He took the virgins that were lit. Well, those are the ones that are practicing the presence of God, practicing Jesus right inside of them saying, no, Jesus is in me. Jesus is in this situation. God knows what's happening to me. God is faithful to me. God can never lie, and I'm going to put my whole weight, my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, my whole body, and I'm going to depend on him wholly because he's wholly true. Now, that's practicing the presence of God. Verse 10 of James chapter 5. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for the example of suffering, afflictions, and of patience. Boy, they sure did suffer a lot. The Old Testament prophets any one of them that had a word, if you read Jeremiah, you'll think, oh my gosh, no wonder he's a weeping prophet. I mean, they threw him in the well. They did not want to hear what he prophesied. And even today, people do not want to hear the hard thing that people pr might be prophesying, you see. So we, we better listen up and listen personally to what the Lord is saying about our times as well. Behold, we count them happy that endure Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Now, we have heard of that, and we certainly do know that Job went through so many, I mean, we don't know how long he went through the, the trial that happened to him. And guess what? God declared him righteous. He had a righteous standing before God, but he didn't know how to walk in that righteousness. And actually, he did all the right things, but he always took credit for it. He thought he was the one doing it. He didn't realize he had the Spirit of God within him, and he gave the glory to himself. So he had a lot to learn about where the glory came from. That's why in the very end of Job, God says, Now, Job, you think you're the one that's producing all this, right, the, the righteousness, that, all the good things that you've done. You think that you're doing the good. Oh, Job, are you thinking you're God? Where were you when I created everything? That's why God said it to him. Job says, Oh, my goodness, I repent. It wasn't me at all. It was you inside of me. And I think every one of us have to go through some kind of Job experience. And he's just saying, uh, pra, uh, pra, be, have the patience of Job. Well, just think about it. He never, he never blasted the devil for coming against him. And he fought with God, but he always saw God. Even though what he was going through, he, ne he, he didn't see the devil. He saw God. And he, uh, at the end, he worshiped God. God never said he sinned either. At the end, he said, You're, the three comforters, you better uh, sacrifice for them because they've sinned. Okay. And then it says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. That, uh, and lest you fall into com condemnation, I think that's exactly what people need to get today. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing song, psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And certainly that goes on in the churches today, thankfully. That is wonderful. 
some people make uh, ministries out of that, and that's fine. But I think it's just talking about, you know, any of your members that are sick, you know, call them forth and have the elders pray that they, they might be healed and anoint them with oil. We certainly have done that in our, our circles as well. Just, we just finished having a conference, and at the end of our conference, we called for anybody that needed prayer, and there was a man that came forth. He said, you know, I've never asked anybody to pray for me before, but I, they've told me that I have prostate cancer. So we prayed for him and prophesied over him, and the prophecy was that your number, because his numbers were so high, like 73, which was like, oh my gosh, horrible. Well, uh, it was prophesied over him, no, they would go down to three, which would be really below normal even. Well, he went to the doctor after, after we prayed for him, and guess what? He was healed. His numbers came all the way down, just like we said. So we just praise the Lord. We don't give ourselves any glory like we're healers. We're not the healer. Jesus is the healer. We give him all the praise and all the glory. And uh, it's not like a practice that we do all the time. It's just as needed as the body of Christ might need, might, might need that. So, and then it said this, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Wow, the prayer of faith. So I think that's important, the prayer of faith. So you can pray and ask and ask and ask. And like he said earlier, you ask amiss. Because asking without faith is powerless. Because the power is in believing, you see. So we can ask and then we can take it that God cannot lie. That he will by his stripes, this person is healed, that person is restored. This situation is, is, is redeemed and reconciled, you see. We have the word of reconciliation for our people and the people that come, you know, among us. We have a word. We have a word from the Spirit for everybody, you know. But it's better to get your own word than to always come to somebody else to pray for you. It's, it's almost better, you, know, you see. When you mature in the Spirit, you won't be running to other people to pray for you. You'll know how to stand in faith yourself, and, and that's the truth. But this is what it says, have the prayer of faith. In other words, believe that by his stripes you are healed. They are healed. So I live healed all the time. I don't even think of sick. I, I believe, believe in healing. And this says, and the Lord shall raise you up, and if he commits sin, they will be forgiven him. Sometimes people are sick because of sin or unbelief and, and grumbling and complaining and fearful. I know before my mother was born again, she was very, she was like a volcano. She was so fearful all the time and exploding all the time on us, condemning us all the time. And you know what? She ended up with rheumatoid arthritis. And I think it's because of, of her unbelief. Uh, and really, she wasn't even born again yet. Well, when she got born again, I'm telling you, she was like the, she was like the difference between Paul before he was saved and then after he was saved. It was a radical transformation and I mean she was the most edifying person you ever want to be around and I mean she had everybody in tears all the time because she had such a great faith word for everybody that she that she came to but she, she did have that arthritis and many times she went for healings we even went to Catherine Kuhlman before she wasn't healed outwardly and we prayed the prayer of faith but I, I think there there's more to understand the people that are not healed. And, you know, I mean, nobody likes to hear that. You like to hear, well, that's not faith. Well, um, you have to make something of, of it when a person doesn't get healed and, and does die of some kind of disease. We kind of act like that nobody's ever going to die. Well, maybe we are of the generation before the Lord that won't die. But um, basically, you know, if the Lord tarries, we're going to go to the grave probably. Uh, but... Don't worry, the bones will rise again. I know that. But anyway, um, pray, for, pray for your sick. And if they have any sin of unbelief, they'll, they'll be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another and you will be healed. See, that's being honest, being walking in the light. I always say that. John says walk in the light. That means, you know, be honest one with the other. Confess your faults one to the other and you'll be healed. You see, walking in the light is... Same as walking in the Spirit. It's the same as uh, counting it all joy. It's the same thing that Paul talks about when he says, 
uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then he brings out a wonderful thing. I love this. Confess your faults one to another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I love that. I love that. Availeth much to, for a righteous man crying out. Let me tell you, I cried out for all my children who were just far away from, they, they knew the Lord, but they sure weren't walking the walk. They were talking the talk sometimes when they were around me, but they weren't walking the walk. And I was not going to be satisfied until they, you know, came through and they were walking exactly what they were saying. So, and that, you can't force that yourself. That's the walking in the spirit. And then the spirit does the walking. Spirit does the talking and the spirit does the walking. Hallelujah. All right. So then it says it brings out Elijah. Boy, do we like Elijah. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Guess what? Elijah was this great, powerful prophet. We all know the Elijah stories about on Mount Carmel. He told Baal's priest to come up there. They built two alt they built an altar and they cut themselves, but they could not make fire come down. And immediately he, j he pours water on his altar and everything else. And immediately he raises his hands and fire comes down and laps up the altar and the water. And I mean, this is a great, mighty man. But, but James is saying, look, he's just like all of us. He's like us. I mean, we've got the spirit within us. We don't have to be whiny and complaining and grumbling and always needy. We don't have to live there. We can, I mean, we're all Elijah's. I mean, we're Elijah in the New Testament. Might be even more powerful than Elijah was in the Old Testament. And it says this, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's exactly what happened. He marched himself right into Ahab's throne room and, and prophesied over him. He came from a little city called Tis, Tichbite. Tichbite. Well, we don't even know where that is. I don't even know if it's on the map. And all of a sudden he shows up and then tells Ahab that it's not going to rain for three years. Well, it didn't. I mean, think about that. That's the, that's the courage of the spirit, the power of the sword of the spirit. Just taking, you know, walking, walking in there. He could not help it. He could not sit at home. I mean, God marched forth in there. And guess what? It did not rain just exactly from his word. And then it says, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Well, that happened after Mount Carmel. He, after uh, the fire came down and, um, and lapped up the water and actually melted the altar, then he went to the edge of the cliff, and he said, and there was nothing but clear sky because it had not rained in three and a half years. Okay, so then he says to his servant, go down to the seashore and see if you can see any clouds. Well, that poor servant went down seven, six times. And finally, the seventh time when he came back up, and seven's always a God number, we know. Okay, when he came back up, he said, there's a little tiny cloud way off in the, in, in, uh, way up in the sky about the size of a fist. And Elijah says, now, he already knew that he just needed one little cloud that size. And he says, get off that mountain right away. It's going to rain so hard. And it did. And we, we see that Elijah all of a sudden turns into a mighty superhero. And he outruns the chariot that Ahab was in. So you talk about super, superheroes. And James is saying this same spirit is inside of us. Now, I don't know what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be doing in our day. But you watch and see the Holy Spirit is going to be moving in mighty ways greater than we have ever seen before. We're headed towards the end, you all. And I mean, the Holy Spirit is going to be in such a move that we're going to be doing and saying, and it's going to be by the Spirit. Make sure it is by the Spirit. You start practicing the presence of God right now where you are. And you see, then you'll be walking in the Spirit and the Spirit will accomplish these exploits right through you. Then it says this, brethren, if any man go, do err in the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Oh, I love that. I love that. Will hide a multitude of sins. Faith for a person. So if you see a person stuck, 
You see a person not practicing the presence of God? Don't condemn him. Don't condemn her. Just pray for them first and pray because the fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And God is faithful. He knows how. Now with that young girl that just died, you see, she's only 40 years old. Now we're expecting the Holy Spirit to use her life. The devil's not going to get a final word here. God's going to get a final word. And we're expecting and we're really demanding from God life coming out of that death because that's his ways. Anytime that something falls in the ground and dies and a person dies, a Christian dies, life comes out of it, especially in, you know, in the life of this girl who had, who had received Christ. So life is going to always come out of death. So I leave you with this. I love this little book. Leave you with it. Out of every negative, there is a God positive. Just hunt for it. I mean, be a God hunter and stand in faith and practice the presence of God in everything that you're going through. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to do this little book of James and we'll continue on. Maybe we'll, we'll do another book real soon. So thank you so much for following this. If you want to see the rest of them, go on The Liberating Secret, look under the playlist on YouTube or on our website, www.theliberatingsecret.org. And thank you so much for joining me and may God richly bless you. Goodbye. I hope that you are being blessed by The Liberating Secret. If you would like to have for yourself my books, booklets, or any of my TV or radio series, check out our website's bookstore. Our TV shows are also on our YouTube site. And be sure to get the Liberating Secret app for your phone. We have an annual Louisville conference in June, as well as a biannual Woman's Retreat at Polly's Island, South Carolina. Come for a weekend or a week of study, fun, fellowship by the ocean. We also have a weekly Bible study. See our website for times and location. My husband and Scott and I would love to come and share the liberating truth to your fellowship, church, or home group. Please call or contact us through the website. If you would like to donate to our ministry, make your checks out to Christ Our Life Ministries, Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. Please pray for us, and we will pray God's very best for you. Secret with your host, author, and teacher Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to the Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm starting a new series. I'm going to be teaching the full book of Romans, one of my very, very favorite epistles of Paul, the apostle. And actually it says, my heading to my Bible says, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Romans. So it was actually to the people in Rome and not, not so much Rome, but to the people, to the Romans. Okay, the Romans who? 
well, the Christians there in Rome. Now, for years, Paul desired to go to Rome. He just had always had that in the back of his heart, the back of his mind, that he wanted to go to Rome. And uh, at one point, uh, he said, I wanted to come to you, but I couldn't. I, the devil prevented it, so I couldn't come. But he always had that in the back of his heart. And uh, so the curious way that the Lord got him to Rome, probably he probably didn't expect it to be that way, but that's just the way, the strange ways of the Lord, how he gets his, uh, his servants to where he wants them to be. And where, how did he get there? Well, he was taken there after he went to Jerusalem and they arrested him, put him in jail for a while. When they found out that he was a Roman citizen, well, they had to send him to Rome. And so on the way, of course, you know, he had a lot of hardship because he, uh, there was a shipwreck and he was bitten by a venomous snake. And my goodness, the devil was trying to kill him even before he got to Rome. And of course, in Rome is where he really suffered uh, his last breath, really death. He suffered death there because it was in Rome's that uh, history tells us that he was beheaded. But while he was there, even in prison, he was writing uh, letters back to his churches, his precious churches. So he always wanted to bring the message of the gospel of grace to the Roman people. Well, who were they? Well, they were Christians, they were, uh, they, but they were Jews and also they were Gentiles. So he's establishing that in the very first chapter of Romans because he says, this message of the gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. So he's saying this gospel now is going to the world, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And so, but, but he was right. He wrote this letter in, uh, in, in Corinthians when he was at the Corinthian city of Corinth. Well, the Corinthian church, now he'd been there like two or three times, and this was like his last time he was there in Corinth. And you know what? He had been there uh, six or eight years earlier. He had won them to Christ, um, the Corinthians, and after six years, still they were not settled. They were not established. Christ had not been formed in them, like he says in Galatians. And that's exactly what Paul's intention is is to establish the early Christians in Christ and to get them fixed in who they really were and what it really means to be a Christian. So he could see in Corinth that it had not even taken root yet fully, that they, because he calls them still, still babes and carnal. And, um, and he says, I know that because there's still divisions and, you know, there's jealousies and prides and pride and all that. And you're not really established in the truth or in the gospel yet. So probably he thought, I've got to write the fullness of the gospel for the Romans. I know I'm going to go there one day, but before I go there, I must, it must, I must precede my coming with a letter or an epistle that's going to have the fullness of the gospel laid out unfolded to us in a clear presentation of the whole gospel to the whole world and that's what his gospel was and actually that's really one of our mottos at Christ our life ministries we have the whole gospel to the whole man to the whole world and so I guess that's our calling too but it certainly was his calling as an apostle and uh, and he wanted them to know the 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 um, the the whole gospel of grace laid out in such a presentation that no one would uh, deny that it was not given to them in a clear way that he had not really done in the other letters even to the Corinthians he's writing to them about their problems and but he he's not he hasn't really laid out the full full gospel he hints of it he brings parts of it because every one of his letters really he weaves in the gospel he does and so um and it and he calls it his gospel i've heard he, he, some people say well he was just arrogant well no he wasn't he was not arrogant it because 
He was one of the most humble of all of the apostles. He was taken down to pure humiliation, really, because he, before he was a Christian, he killed all those Christians. And so, and God said to him, and Jesus said to him, when he was on the road to Damascus, why, why have you persecuted me? Why have you killed me? Because the body of Christ is a form of Christ. It's the bodily form of Christ. And when you kill and persecute Christians, you're actually persecuting and killing Jesus, a part of Jesus, his own body. And so, so with that as the background of what he had done before he was a Christian, that, that brought him to the most humble of all of the apostles because he had done that. Did he get forgiveness? Absolutely, he got forgiveness. Did he get the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Yes, absolutely, he got the whole fullness of the Holy Spirit. And by this fullness and by the fullness and the wisdom of God, he wrote this treasure. And I think the, the gospel in the book of Romans is the, mo is the uh, most, uh, is the greatest treasure really in the New Testament. One of the greatest treasures because it brings out the fullness of the gospel. And let me tell you how important it is to understand Romans, not just part of it, but the fullness, what it means to be justified by faith, what it means to be sanctified by faith, what it means to then walk in the spirit and live the intercessory life. And that's exactly how Romans is laid out. But there's a very strong verse that Paul brings out in the very second chapter of Romans, what I think we need to pay attention to. I know we do. So I'm going to read you this verse. And I want us to really remember the importance of us, the body of Christ, fully understanding, with full understanding, full wisdom, full knowledge of what the fullness of the gospel is. Because I believe that most Christians only know part of the gospel. They don't know the fullness of the gospel. So listen to what Paul says about how important it is. In verse 16 of chapter 2, Paul says this, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Whoa. So we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians tells us that the Christians are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to be judged according to to Paul's gospel. Do you see how important it is to understand the fullness of that gospel? And maybe we haven't really totally understood the fullness. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit intends to do in bringing this presentation of the Roman letter. So let us begin. So I will read, and then we will certainly expound as the Spirit gives us the utterance and as the Spirit opens it up, because we are totally trusting the Holy Spirit, to be the teacher here. We're not, we're not trusting in ourselves. We're not trusting in my flesh. We're not trusting in any uh, education or whatever I have or don't have. We're trusting in the Holy Spirit in Him alone in revealing the fullness of this gospel to His body. Let's start in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, of God, the gospel of God, which is the gospel of grace in a, and truth in our Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished at the cross, really, is what he means by that. So what he's saying is that he's called to be an apostle. Well, let's look in Acts to, to where he was called to be an apostle. This is in, um, in what his calling actually is. It's in chapter 9, and this is his calling. After he was on the road to Damascus, and he was blinded, he was led into Damascus, and, um, and Ananias laid hands on him. He received the Holy Spirit. He received his sight. And this is what the Holy Spirit told Ananias was, was Paul's calling, and I'm sure Ananias relayed this to Paul. It's in chapter 9, verse 15. 
But the Lord said to you, Go that way, Paul, for he, uh, uh, no, no, excuse me. This is, this is the Lord talking to Ananias because Ananias didn't know if he wanted to go lay hands on Paul because Paul had been a killer of all the Christians. And so he was, he was pretty apprehensive about it. So this is what the Lord says to Ananias. Go that way, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, first to the Gentiles, not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, and kings and the children of Israel, which would be the Jews as well. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So his calling is a calling of suffering. Wow. But a, a calling of proclamation, proclaiming the gospel to the world. Now the other apostles, Peter, John, James, um, even Peter said, Paul's hard to understand. So there's, you know, I think it took Paul, Peter a while to really understand the fullness of the gospel of grace that was given to Paul. And we see that in Galatians where Paul actually comes against Peter publicly and really lets him have it because he's, he's, he's introducing law back in with the gospel of grace. And law and grace does not mix, just like oil and water does not mix. Neither does law and grace. It does, you, do, you do not mix the true. You're either under the law and under the curse, or you're under the grace of God, which is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so, um, so Peter, I think Peter, John, and especially after uh, the temple was destroyed in 78 AD, and all the other apostles who were there in Jerusalem, uh, they were scattered all over the place. Well, they had to find out the full meaning of the gospel of grace. And I think Peter caught up with what Paul was teaching. So it was Paul that really had this gospel of grace. And it is Paul that we totally need to understand as the body of Christ. I mean, I love the Old Testament. I love the stories of the Old Testament. You glean so much out of the Old Testament. It's a pattern of New Testament realities, the children of Israel in the wilderness, the body of Christ still struggling to try to find out who they are, uh, the children of Israel finally going across the Red Sea, the body of Christ finally moving into their sonship in Romans 8 and, and understanding the Spirit of God lives within us and is our very life, and understanding that that's moving into the promised land. So everything in the Old Testament is a pattern of New Testament realities. But you see, Jesus set everybody straight by saying the kingdom of God is within us. So we've got to understand what it means to have the indwelling kingdom of God first, actually, before Jesus comes in history, to set up the outer kingdom of God on, on the earth. I mean, that's, that's coming soon. We all believe that. We all really believe that times are, are headed up to the time when Jesus will actually come on the Mount of, Ol uh, Mount of Olives, and that mount will divide from the north to the, to the east to the west. My goodness. And he will step down, oh, wow, on that Mount of Olives, and we will see him in person. How glorious will that day be? Well, we better be equipped. We better be established. We better know in the body of Christ the fullness of what this little book, this little letter is really revealing to us. Okay, so Paul is the apostle that is going to bring back, bring this good news. And that's really what the gospel means. It's good news. It's not bad news. It would be bad news if we were st still like some of the early Christians and trying to keep part of the law and then trying to add grace to it as well. That would be bad news. And Peter finally knew that in Acts 15 because, why, because he said, why would we put that yoke upon the new Christians that are Gentiles when we, we Jews, that was a yoke on us and we couldn't fulfill it ourselves. Why should we put them back under the law? 
And so he, he, he certainly came, came free from the putting any law on grace. It cannot be mixed. It cannot. A lot of people are doing that today. And Paul, Paul's pretty emphatic in Galatians. He says, if anybody does that, let them be accursed. So we, we need to really beware of not mixing law and grace. It's, it's by the grace of God that we every one of us are saved, not by works of any righteousness that we have ever done or will do saves us. What saves us is, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he took our place at Calvary that, and, and, and uh, was crucified on my behalf, was buried on my behalf, was raised on my behalf, and now seated in heaven. And, and, and Galatians, I mean, Ephesians tells us that we're seated there with him, together with him in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. But before us being seated there with him, the Holy Spirit had to come to earth, and that's what happened at Pentecost, that great day when the fire of God came out of heaven and landed on their heads, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What great day! The disciples really, truly could not totally understand Jesus until that day, and he knew that. Jesus knew that. So now Paul is delivering the gospel. Verse 2, this is what he says, which he hath which God hath promised beforehand by his his prophets in the holy scriptures. He's talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, how God promised the savior concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. So God promised it and now now, Paul is, is, is going to explain to you what it means to know the Son that God had promised, even in the Old Testament. Okay, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, meaning that he was the legal right, the legal, the legal king to the throne of David. Legally, he was of his bloodline. He was the seed, the promised seed that was promised to David that would sit on his throne. My goodness. No other person could take that place, even as a human being, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And, he, and when he became man, and he came first as a human with the seed of David. Oh, and declare to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. That proves that he is the son of God. So this is establishing that Jesus Christ was the son of man, legally, the legal heir to David's throne. But not only that, he was also the son of God, and the proof of it was that he was raised from the dead. His resurrection is the proof that he was truly the son of God. So he's legally the son of man and, and declared the son of God by the resurrection of the dead. Wow. Five, verse five. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. He's talking about himself and the other apostles. He says, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith. I love that little phrase there. For the obedience to the faith. That, that starts out this whole letter, obedience of faith. The only way we can truly obey is if we take the gospel by faith, if we take Christ by faith. Everything is by faith. Is, that's obedient. You're, you're being an obedient son of God when you take all this by faith. You see, not by works, but by faith. He also ends this whole letter in the very last chapter, uh, last chapter, which is in 16, he says, for the obedience of faith, he says it in the last chapter as well. So it's in the first chapter. These are bookends to this whole book, the obedience of faith. And so that's what God is calling us to obey simply by faith. We think we're supposed to obey by doing. We're meant to obey first by faith. The doing will follow. The doing will follow, but it will not it, now, it will not come after 
faith. We want to do and then think now we've got the faith. No, faith comes first and the doing flows out of the faith because the Holy Spirit then is the doer that lives inside of us and does the good works through us. Okay, so um, and then he says, but this faith, this obedience of faith, I'm going to deliver this to all nations. You see, and of course, it was his his world was smaller than the world we know today. So America hadn't been discovered. You know, he they knew Africa and they knew Europe and they knew certainly Rome and certainly the all the all the part. Maybe they didn't know the fullness of of Europe. Maybe they hadn't been there. So it was pretty much just the Roman Empire at that time. Okay, but he's there to proclaim. He is the proclaimer. You know what? I always say Jesus was the proclaimer. Paul certainly was the proclaimer of the kingdom of God, but he also was the explainer. And I say the difference between a proclaimer and an explainer is Jesus didn't explain a whole lot. He just proclaimed. And you had to just believe him because it was coming from the Spirit. Maybe you didn't get the fullness of what he was proclaiming. And of course, maybe you didn't understand, and they certainly didn't understand. But now the Holy Spirit has come to the body of Christ. And now he wants to bring the full explanation of how this gospel, what this gospel is, and how it works in us. The full meaning and the wisdom of how it all, how this gospel lives in us and the truth of the gospel, which is really the mystery of the gospel, which is really Christ in us, the hope of glory, which is the whole mystery of the gospel. So he says this, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. You're also called. If you or a Christian today. Now, is, who is he talking to? The whole world? Well, not really, because the next verse tells us. It says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of, beloved of God, called to be saints. So he's saying, he's saying, I'm not saying this. I'm talking to Christians here. And I always love to say that our ministry, you know, we love the ministry of evangelism. We love to lead people to Christ in the first place. But People have to be led into or discipled after they're brought into Christ. You know, they have to be disciples, discipled on the fullness of what it means to be in Christ. That's what I believe our ministry is doing. So he as well is saying, I'm, tell, I'm preaching and teaching the ones that are called to be saints. Those are the Christians. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Then he says this in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. I'm so thankful for you. You were probably born again at Pentecost because probably uh, the, uh, the Jews that were at Pentecost went back to Rome, you know, and started the new, new churches and uh, then brought the Gentiles in because they, they are now, now the gospel goes to the Jew and the Gentile. Well, we can see in Galatians, that Paul says that Paul that Peter is his apostleship is for the Jews, but Paul's apostleship is for the Gentiles. Now I, I always say, "Wow, just think, the people that you hate the most in your old life is the very ones that he was called to. He hated the Gentiles. The Jews were so special they hated the Gentiles, which was exactly not God's way at all." If they had understood Abraham's promises, that God had promised Abraham that he would be a father of many nations, not just one nation, or not just the, the two houses, the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, but also many nations. So if the Jews had really understood that, then they would have understood the Gentiles were going to be included too. So, um, so Paul certainly knew that. And now he, his calling is to the Gentiles. Just think of it. If God calls you to the very people that you naturally cannot stand, wow, you got to have some adjustment there. I think we all will, would have some adjustment. Actually, I've heard of, you know, the story about Miss Bertha going to China. She was raised in Cowpen, South Carolina. Now she's called to the Chinese. That culture is different and maybe not anybody that she would like to be called to, but those are the people that God calls you to. 
Why? Because it has to be his love for those people. You can't try to love them and try to fit into their conference, their, their uh, culture. You have got to have his spirit, his spirit of love, the spirit of truth, the spirit of love that he is inside of us to, to adjust us really to be the missionaries to the people that we might not like at all. And I can see that's exactly, a lot of times he's, I know that he's done that with me. The people that I don't like the least are the ones that he's calling me to. So that never matters whether I like them or not because he is love and he's love in me. And what happens is you end up loving them and laying your life down to, for the very people that he called you for. And that's exactly Paul's attitude to the very people that he called me to. I lay my life down. So I see my time's over. I'm just beginning this wonderful letter, this wonderful presentation of the gospel of grace, and I'll continue it next time. So thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Goodbye. I hope that you are being blessed by the liberating secret. If you would like to have for yourself my books, booklets, or any of my TV or radio series, check out our website's bookstore. Our TV shows are also on our YouTube site. And be sure to get the Liberating Secret app for your phone. We have an annual Louisville conference in June, as well as a biannual Women's Retreat at Polly's Island, South Carolina. Come for a weekend or a week of study, fun, fellowship, by the ocean. We also have a weekly Bible study. See our website for times and location. My husband and Scott and I would love to come and share the liberating truth to your fellowship, church, or home group. Please call or contact us through the website. If you would like to donate to our ministry, make your checks out to Christ Our Life Ministries Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. Please pray for us, and we will pray God's very best for you.